Well, good morning. Thank you to the worship team. I'm glad you're all here this morning. Welcome. As you know, we're going through the book of John as a church family, and it sure has been off to a great start. It's been a real treat so far, so I'm thankful for being in John 1 and getting uh, reintroduced to Jesus all over again. In this morning's passage, we're wrapping up chapter 1, and we get to witness Jesus assembling his first disciples. So I'm excited to go through how this remarkable group of people, these men who will change the world, are brought together. A bit of a disclaimer, there are no auditions, no interviews, no tryouts, no skill testing. It's truly unlike any other team being assembled. Um, so we're going to cover John 1 from verses 35 down to the end of the chapter, which is 51. I believe it's on page 886 of your pew Bibles, if that sounds right. Um, and you can be thinking about the structure. It's pretty simple as I read through the passage for us. There really are two main sections because it tracks two separate days. If you recall, last week we covered day one and two. This week we covered day three and four. And so both sections start with the next day, the next day. So day three will be verse 35 down to 42, which we'll see being introduced to Jesus. And then in day four, verse 43 down to 51, following Jesus. So let's read our, our pericope, John 1, 35 to 51. Please stand with me as you're able for the reading of God's word. The next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, Come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This is the word of the Lord. Be please be seated and please join me in prayer for our time. Dear Heavenly Father, would you please illuminate this passage for us? We want to dwell on your word and make much of it. Please, Lord, help us see what you would have us see and help us know what you would have us know and let it dwell within us that we could continue to make much of you as 
You reveal yourself to us in the pages of your word. Amen. All right, so I'm ready to jump in with part one, verse 35 down to 42, being introduced to Jesus. You don't want to delay that. And we're going to start with John the Baptist introduces Jesus. And so we'll go through this first section a little bit faster than the second, because there's a little more to unpack in the second half. So we'll spend a little more time on that section. There's so much that we could cover. There are endless sermons that could be delivered on this passage. So this is just a taste of the feast that is in this passage. But I do want us to pace ourselves because the entire text is a narrative and it seems so simple that we could just breeze through it if we weren't careful and not let it leave any kind of an imprint on us. It's not like Paul's epistles, right, with his long sentences and flowery languages. I mean, why so many subordinate clauses, Paul? The gospel writer John uses short sentences, short verses, short quotes. The dialogue is quick, and it all works to speed us through the passage. So we have to be intentional to make the decision to slow down and weigh each verse as we go. But look how quickly it goes. Look at the first three verses. Verse 35, John the Baptist is hanging out with two of his disciples. Verse 36, Jesus walks by and John the Baptist calls out Jesus to Jesus, Behold the Lamb of God. Verse 37, his two disciples hear this and follow Jesus. It's like boom, boom, boom. It seems so simple and self-explanatory. What even is there to expand on? Well, let's take our time. First of all, in last week's sermon... Pastor Utah mentioned that John the Baptist's ministry was all about pointing others away from himself and towards Christ. Well, we see that in action, from the theoretical to the practical. John the Baptist points Jesus out physically, and we too will need to transition our faith from the theoretical to the practical. But think about what this means for John the Baptist's disciples. They would have been expecting Jesus not just through their study of the scriptures of the Old Testament, but also through John the Baptist's teachings and his preaching. They would have known that in his word, God had promised to send the Messiah, the Christ, who would come to reconcile man and God. And John the Baptist was able to connect the dots for them, to connect the promise with the fulfillment of the promise in the person of Jesus. I call this out because... When you read the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, this account can leave you thinking that Jesus called the disciples out of the blue. But John gives us a little more context here. These first disciples were already spiritual followers of Christ as they sat under John the Baptist's teaching. They would have been awaiting his arrival on the scene. They would have been praying for it. They would have been studying the meaning of his arrival, the profound significance of Jesus' coming and what he would accomplish on earth. So that does help explain why they do not hesitate to leave John the Baptist in favor of Christ. That was the point of his teaching. It was always going to lead to this point. He must increase and I must decrease. Don't follow me, follow the Lord. So in verse 38, these two disciples start to follow Jesus, and Jesus sees that they're following him. He turns around and asks them, what are you seeking? This can sound like a natural question to ask if you notice that someone's following you. Can I help you? What are you looking for? But we'll see, of course, that there is a lot more to this question. In fact, we'll see this as a theme throughout this passage and actually throughout the whole Gospel of John. The words spoken by Jesus as recorded by the apostle are loaded with meaning. Jesus speaks in a way that works on at least two planes. Always makes sense on the physical level, but it also has a much more profound meaning on the spiritual level as he tries to draw us from the physical to the spiritual. So while this dialogue seems fairly innocuous, just sort of simple everyday conversation, this exchange has a whole other deeper meaning to it, a whole other level that is ripe with profound truth. 
And if you pay attention throughout the passage, you'll see that Jesus' words become increasingly spiritual. It becomes harder and harder to interpret them as merely physical. They become more obviously spiritual. But I'm getting ahead of myself. In response to the question of what they are seeking, the two disciples refer to Jesus as rabbi, which literally means my great one. But they don't mean it that way. They just mean it as teacher, which is the common use of the term. Um, The Apostle John makes sure we understand that. And the two disciples answer Jesus with their own question. Where are you staying? So we have to think about how to interpret that answer. This is how I think about it. Because I'm not always the most organized guy. So if I don't use something every day, I probably don't know where to find it when I need it. So for example, if I've been looking for a hole punch for a long time, I need to figure out where it should live after I've used it so I'll know where it is next time. And I'll decide, yeah, I'll put it on this shelf in this box marked miscellaneous stuff. That'll do the trick. Now I wanna be careful not to be unfair to the disciples. It's kind of easy to dunk on them because they're piecing the significance of all this together for the first time. That being said, it does feel to me a little bit like their motivation in asking Jesus where he is staying is similar to my finding a home for my hole punch. Now that they've found the one they've been seeking, they want to be able to find him again. So they want to know where he's staying. And here's an important note. Christ is not a hole punch. You can't pull him out of your junk drawer when you need him. And here I want to admit, it's not just the apostles. We can all be tempted to keep Christ in his place, where we can find him when we need him, but where he won't interfere with our day-to-day life. I don't just get to keep him in my back pocket and pull him out when I'm in a bind when I need him because things got hard at work or have a specific prayer request for him. That's not how it works. We cannot treat Jesus Christ like some sort of consultant. We don't get to issue a request for proposals and determine whether or not we want to take his recommendation under advisement. He's our Lord. We either pledge allegiance to his headship and follow him through every circumstance, through fire and flood, or we will have to make an account to him. You don't pick him up and put him down again. What Christ demands of you is that you follow him and do not depart. When he reveals himself to you, there is no more keeping him at bay. You drop everything and you follow him. And there's no more departing from him. Remember last week, Pastor Utah issued the call to embrace humility. And he asked the question, are you willing to put yourself in second position? Are you willing to put your will for your life aside and surrender your life to Christ? Well, in verse 39, that is the call that Jesus places on these disciples when he answers their question. Come and you will see. What Jesus loads into his response here is, why should you have to find me again? Why would you depart from me? You found me, so come with me now. And how do they respond? Well, they followed him and stayed the rest of the day. We're told it's the 10th hour, which is about 4 p.m. They did not depart. Make no mistake, when Jesus asked them, what they were seeking. Jesus was not asking them if they needed directions to the library. He was asking them the question that God extends to all men and women. What are you seeking? What are you pursuing in this life? What is guiding you through this world? What is your purpose? And his gracious invitation to all men and women is... Come and see. All that you're seeking in life can be found in Christ. All you have to do is drop everything and come to know him, and you will see what you were created for. 
Jesus issues this invitation to the entire world, and if you're not already a follower of Christ, well, this is him right now issuing this invitation to you this morning. Come and see. Do not breeze through any of Jesus' words in the Bible. They're always steeped in rich implications for your life. Now, I want us to note the beginning of a pattern that emerges here as well. These disciples find Jesus because John the Baptist points them to him. And now one of them is going to point his brother to Jesus. So let's dig into the witness of Andrew. Andrew introduces Jesus. Until now, the disciples are nameless. But in verse 40, the apostle John tells us who one of them is. Andrew, Peter's brother. Now, Peter has not been introduced in the story yet, but the assumption of the Apostle John for his readers is that they know Peter. (laughs) He was a central figure to the early church. This gospel was written after the other three. If you're reading John, you know who Peter is. And so in verse 41, Andrew finds his brother Simon Peter and tells him, we found him, the Messiah, Christ, the one the entire Old Testament was talking about and pointing forward to. The one that folks in our text have been expectantly awaiting for generations. Andrew can't wait to tell his brother, we found the Messiah. This text is used quite commonly in sermons about evangelism, and you see why, right? Last week, Pastor Utah noted that John the Baptist is the model messenger, and now we see his model put into practice. We get a picture of what it looks like, and what you see is that evangelism is personal, brother to brother, sister to sister. I have found Jesus. Let me tell you about him. This is the way. Remember what Paul says. We are reconciled to God through Christ, and we are immediately enrolled into the ministry of reconciliation as ambassadors for Christ. John tells Andrew. Andrew tells Peter. No one sits on this information and keeps it from their friends and loved ones. That's what you do when you encounter Christ. You long to introduce the ones you love to him. That is evangelism, a personal introduction to Christ. You're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. So proclaim who Jesus is. Introduce others to him the way you were introduced to him, as Andrew does with his brother Peter. All you have to do is present them to Christ, and Christ reveals himself from there, just as he does next with Peter. Verse 42, Andrew takes Peter to Jesus, and now Jesus introduces himself. And lo and behold, Jesus already knows him. You are Simon, the son of John. That's what happens when you come to know Jesus. You realize he already knows you because he's been there all along, waiting patiently for you to turn to him. In our passage, we see that not only does Jesus already know Peter, but Jesus does something unexpected here. Not exactly protocol when you meet someone for the first time. Jesus renames him. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. That's where he gets the name that we all know him by. And I'm not going to get into the meaning of his new name because John doesn't. For that, you can jump into the synoptics on your own time. But here in our passage, what we see is that Jesus demonstrates his authority over Peter by naming him. It is a flex. Like a parent naming a child, it is his authority and privilege to do so. There's a pattern in the Old Testament from Adam naming all the animals that he has dominion over, to God renaming Abram to Abraham and Jacob to Israel, Jesus has a similar authority and privilege here. He calls Peter what he intends to make him. Jesus defines who Peter is. He declares his identity. And now don't think that you are exempt from this. You don't get to be whoever you want to be. You get to be who Jesus says you are. You don't get to be whatever you want to be. You get to be what your creator created you to be. You can get to know your creator and find out who you were created to be. Or you can rebel against your creator and attempt to project who you want to be to to others. But that projection doesn't change who you are. 
Your identity is already set by Christ. From before the beginning of time, he called you to himself, to be a follower of his, a disciple. He has claimed you. You didn't sign up to join his ranks. He enlisted you. And that's how you find Jesus. Someone else introduces you to him. That's how it works. And when he reveals himself to you in this way, then you realize he's already claimed you as his own. He has all authority over you already, even to declare who you are. You're no longer who you thought you were prior to coming to Christ. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And that's good news for everyone. There's nothing to be lamented or missed in the old self for any one of us. Now listen, not everyone will agree with this. If you're not a follower of Christ and you're happy with your own definition of who you are, with what you're accomplishing in your life on your own terms, if you're confident in all the choices that you've made in your life, oh, and you don't think that life can possibly ever send anything your way that you can't handle, then all I'll say is you're not ready to encounter Christ. But on the other hand, if you feel the weight of keeping up, of keeping it all together, if you feel like you're treading water and you don't know how long you can keep this up, keep your head above the surface, then I want you to know that Jesus knows you. Do you find comfort in that? Are you comforted by the fact that Jesus knows you? I mean, it means that you're never alone. He knows you behind any kind of facade. He knows what is real, what is a projection. Because we don't go around advertising how much we're struggling. We don't tell everyone we meet how hard life is. You may look like you've got it all together at work, on Instagram, or even at church. But Jesus cuts through all of that. You're wonderfully and fearfully made. You are precious and full of dignity. You carry within you the image of God. But all that is entangled and ensnared with sin. There's a lot that is not worth preserving. All that is petty and angry and unforgiving and self-aggrandizing and boastful and selfish and perverted. None of that is worth clinging to. If Jesus reveals himself to you, he will flush all that away. He will drown all that sin in his blood. And you will emerge brand new. With a new identity, you're no longer alone in your circumstances. You're known. You're no longer trying to fit in. You're chosen. You're no longer trying to be accepted. You're adopted. You're no longer trying to be successful. You're an heir to the king. And you're no longer trying to find your way in this world because you are found. Because this is the twist. In finding Christ you're the one who becomes found. When you find Christ, you realize he's the one who found you. Let's look at this fourth day, second part here, what this means about following Jesus. First of all, Jesus leads you onto a new path. Verse 43 starts with the next day. Now, Jesus is on the move. The next day, he leaves Bethany and heads to Galilee. And there we read, he finds Philip and calls him. Now, the most you know, obvious interpretation is that he refers to Jesus. Jesus finds Philip and calls him. Although the Greek is a little more ambiguous, actually, about whether the he refers to Jesus or to Andrew. If you recall in verse 41, we read, first Andrew gets Peter. And there's no second. I mean, this could be second he finds Philip. Verse 44 tells us Philip is from Bethsaida, which is where Andrew and Peter are from. So it's certainly possible that Andrew would have found, he would have known Philip and then made the introduction. In fact, in every other case, 
the disciples are introduced to Jesus. Jesus does not introduce himself directly. That being said, I'm fine to go with the interpretation that Jesus found Philip. It's not problematic. To be honest, however you encounter Christ, it doesn't really matter. All that matters is that you encounter Christ. All conversions are different, individual, personal. We should not expect them to follow the same pattern. Where and how he finds you is very secondary. Whether Jesus finds you in your mansion, crushed by the pressure of keeping up the payments, or he finds you in a shelter, not knowing where you're going to sleep tomorrow, whether he finds you on a bar stool in a jail cell in the corner office, whether he finds you at your desk surfing porn, or he finds you bawling your eyes out in a church pew. The only thing that matters is the path that you take from there. It must be the path that is led by Jesus. What matters is that you follow him now. Jesus changes who you are and the path you are on, and he will lead you into a new life. We see this starting at verse 45. Philip now finds Nathanael, and he tells him, we have found the one they have, the, that they've been seeking. He calls him the one of whom Moses and the law... He calls him the one whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote about. So these guys obviously know their Old Testament. He's referring to Moses' prophecy in Deuteronomy 18. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is him that you will listen to. So just as we've noted the two different levels throughout this passage, right? The physical plane and the spiritual plane. We see here that it's also true of Jesus. Jesus, man, or Christ. Because look here how Philip introduces Jesus. Philip calls him not Jesus from heaven, the son of God. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And then in verse 46, Nathanael reacts to Philip's declaration with what we can only, I mean, I guess, charitably describe as skepticism, but maybe prejudice. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nazareth, come on. I don't hang out with anyone from Nazareth. There's no denying this is a little ugly. It's dismissive. It reeks of condescension and arrogance, maybe even bigotry. Philip responds to Nathaniel the only way he can. Come and see. Come see for yourself. And yeah, this is exactly what Jesus said to Philip. And now he extends the same invitation to Nathaniel. And that's all we can really say to the skeptic and the acerbic. Come and see. You cannot argue someone into believing. They have to come to their own faith. It cannot be handed down to anyone. Apologetics have their limitations. Evangelism is not an exercise in trying to convince someone because we're helpless. There is nothing we can say or do that is going to convince someone that Jesus is who he says he is. Your witness may open someone up to this invitation to come and see, but that's as far as you can lead someone. You can lead someone to the source of living water, but you can't Make them drink, so to speak. You can tell of what Christ has done in your own life. You can live in a way that shows that you're no longer the same person. You can invite them to read about him in the Bible. You can invite them to pray that he would reveal himself to them. But you cannot reveal Christ to someone else. You simply don't have that authority over Christ. He will soften the heart. He will soften. He will harden the heart he will harden. He will reveal himself to who he reveals himself to in his own timing, if it is his will. But you still issue the invitation. Come and see. Now verse 47, while Nathanael is still walking towards Jesus, Jesus sees him and reveals himself to him by declaring, Behold an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Now, I do think that this verse 47 is fairly pivotal in our text. 
I think you can now see that Jesus' words are starting to be more overtly spiritual. His greeting to Nathanael continues to work on a couple of different levels, but it's harder to see this one as just a common saying. It feels weightier. Now, if you were to interpret this as simply as possible, then it's a greeting with a first impression character assessment. Hey, nice to meet you. I see you're nobody's fool. I don't know. That's not super convincing. Obviously, we're not going to stay at that surface level. So let's plunge in. I believe that the key to unlocking the deeper meaning of this greeting is Psalm 32. If you wouldn't mind turning to Psalm 32, I'm going to read the first five verses. Because there's, we know that Jesus knows the Psalms. He meditated on the Psalms. There's no way that when he told Nathaniel he is a man in whom there is no deceit, that he was not aware of Psalm 32, verse 2, which says, blessed is the man in whom there is no deceit. It's not a coincidence. Jesus is hyperlinking over to Psalm 32. So let me read the first five verses. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Selah. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Selah. So, why is the man in whom there is no deceit blessed? Because he does not deceive himself or try to deceive God about his sin. He acknowledges his sins to God. He confesses his transgressions to the Lord, and he is forgiven the iniquity of his sins. So do you see what Jesus is saying to Nathanael? At the surface level, you might ask yourself, why is Jesus complimenting this guy? He's shown he's prejudiced against anyone from Nazareth. Quite honestly, Nathanael seems like a jerk. But Jesus is saying to Nathaniel, I know you can be a jerk. And I also know that you know you can be a jerk. There's no deceit in you. You're not deceiving yourself about who you are. Based on the full context of Psalm 32, and given the reaction Jesus gets from Nathaniel, I believe Jesus knows that Nathaniel sees his sin, that he confesses it to God, and that he repents of it. That's what I'm piecing together here. I mean, look at how Nathanael reacts. Verse 48, Nathanael asked Jesus, rather dumbfounded, how do you know me? Obviously, Jesus' remark hit the bullseye here. It resonated deeply within Nathanael. He doesn't say, what makes you think that about me? He doesn't say, you know, why would you think that? No, how do you know me? Such a simple comment. And yet it's so very incisive. And it's a good question, Nathaniel. How does Jesus know him? He says, well, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Okay. So we need to continue piecing this together because we don't know what Nathaniel was doing under that fig tree. We're not told. But Nathaniel knows. He remembers. He knows exactly what he was doing, and he knows Jesus knows as well. So let's think about this. Why did Jesus call up Psalm 32? Imagine Nathaniel was under the fig tree praying to God, like the man described in Psalm 32. What if he was confessing and repenting of his sin, just as it says in the psalm? So picture Nathaniel completely exposed and vulnerable in front of his God saying, this is who I am, a sinful man. Lord, please forgive me. Please, Lord, see me in all my fallen, broken sinfulness. And please forgive me of my sin. 
Lord, you promised to forgive me and to cleanse me of my sin if I came to you in repentance. See me now and forgive me, Lord. And then Jesus comes along and says, Nathaniel, when you opened yourself up to God earlier under that fig tree, when you said, Lord, see me as I am, nothing do I hide from you. Nathaniel, that is when I saw you. You want to know how I know you, Nathaniel? That's how I know you. I saw you under that fig tree. Just imagine the impact that would have on how Nathaniel viewed Jesus. That little comment about seeing him under the fig tree is not only Jesus saying he physically saw him under a tree. It's Jesus telling Nathaniel he saw deep into his spirit. That he knows him at the core of his spirit. And he's converted like that. Verse 49, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You're the king of Israel. Nathaniel goes from skeptic to believer in that instant because he knows he is known. All the defenses built up to guard his heart against being deceived, all his efforts to not be taken in, it all comes crashing down as he realizes this guy is the real deal. As Jesus demonstrates that he knows Nathaniel, not merely on the surface level, not just who he projects to be in public, but that he knows who he is in the most private, intimate, spiritual way. So Nathaniel recognizes he's not merely Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph, but Jesus from heaven, the son of God. Can we just marvel at this for a moment longer? I want us to take in the full impact of being known. Not just at the surface level like we all know each other here. It's lovely. But the truly deep, intimate, spiritual knowledge by the one who sits in heaven right now at the right hand of the throne of God interceding on your behalf. Jesus knows us. There's nothing we can hide from him. So we can bring every fiber of who we are to him. We can lay it all before him in confession and repentance. And it doesn't change how he views us because he already knows what's inside. In the deepest recesses of our hearts, the parts we don't even like to admit to ourselves. And despite what he knows, and it is despite at no point did Jesus look in there and think, wow, that's impressive. No. Despite what he sees there, he loves us. When we refuse to bring our sin to God, as David says in Psalm 32, when we cling to our sin and deceive ourselves into believing that we've done nothing wrong, it wasn't our fault, we were justified, our intentions were good, and our bones waste away through our groaning all day long. For day and night, God's hand weighs heavy upon us. Our strength is dried up as by the heat of summer. But when we turn to God in confession and repentance, when we refuse to be deceived by our sin, when we acknowledge our sin to God and we do not cover our iniquity, when we say, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, then the Lord forgives the iniquity of our sin. Because when Jesus knows you, he doesn't recoil in horror. And to be clear, nor does he applaud you for being who you are. He doesn't affirm you in your sin. No, Jesus knows you in your worst moments, your breakdowns, your outbursts, your tantrums, your self-pity, your complaints and grumbles, your jealousies and envies, your meanest and most petty moments, all those sinful impulses. And Jesus neither washes his hands of us nor celebrates and affirms us. No, he cleanses us of that. This is what we will be reflecting on, remembering when we take communion in a few minutes. This is what Jesus accomplished for us, what he came down from heaven for, to take 
all that sin to put it to death. He died on the cross for all that sin, your sin, my sin, everyone's but his own. He died because that's the cost of sin. It's death. Either our death, all of our deaths for all of our sin, or his alone, just the one death, the perfect sacrifice, the death of the sinless one to pay for the sins of all. We remember this because when you come to understand what Christ did, then you're not left unchanged. That shakes the foundations your life is constructed on. And if you can no longer believe who you thought you were, then you can embrace who Jesus declares you to be. The old has passed away. Behold, the new is here. Newness of life in Christ, no longer burdened by our sin, freed of our sin, free to live the life Christ calls us to live, following him in holiness and living for him as a new creation with a new identity and a new purpose. An encounter with Jesus changes your life. And as we're going to read in the next verses, that will leave us changed not just in this life, but changed for eternity as Jesus leads you to the house of God. Now, it could seem at first that verse 50 is Jesus... It's sort of playing down Nathaniel's reaction a little bit. You believe because I saw you under the fig tree. You think you know who I really am because I know who you really are. But are you sure you fully grasp who I am? He's just actually playing up the truth of who he is. Verse 51 is amazing. Nathaniel, you will see heaven open. And the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Then you will truly know who I am. As much as we declare Jesus is Lord, nothing can possibly compare to how we will see Christ when he returns in power and glory. And there is no more denying that Jesus is speaking in, of the spiritual world here in verse 51, is there? Now, I want to note that when the Apostle John records Jesus as saying, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened. This you in the Greek is plural. He's not only speaking to Nathaniel. You know what I'm saying? If this was the Texan standard version, it would be, y'all will see heaven opened. The Apostle John wants you to know that Jesus is speaking to you also this morning. You We'll see Jesus for who he really is. We will all see him as the conquering king dispensing his awful justice. We will all see him for who he truly is, whether we want to or not. This last verse, verse 51, is so deep and rich in significance. Once again, Jesus is communicating a few different things here. First of all, in the simplest reading of the text, he is affirming what all his new disciples are longing to have confirmed. He is confirming he is the one foretold in the Old Testament. Daniel prophesied of the Messiah like a son of man, and Jesus is saying, yeah, that's me. But then, of course, you will also recognize that Jesus is referring back to Jacob's vision of a great ladder that you read about in Genesis 28. Jacob dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven, and behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. This is as explicit a call out as you can possibly get. In fact, Jesus had actually already teed up this reference to Jacob in his greeting of Nathanael, when he said he was a good Israelite in whom there is no deceit. There was one more reading of that. Think about what it means to be an Israelite. An Israelite is a member of the nation of Israel, named after the father of the nation, Israel, who was originally called Jacob, right? Jacob is the father of the nation of Israel. I want you to recall that Jacob was a deceiver. There was 
deceit in Jacob. Jacob literally means deceiver. When Jesus makes this reference to Genesis 28, the context is that Jacob was experiencing the consequences of his deceit. He was fleeing from his brother, whom he deceived out of his birthright. So Jacob is alone in the wild, exhausted from running. He lays his head on a rock to sleep, and he sees the vision of the ladder upon which angels are ascending and descending to and from heaven. God revealed this to Jacob, the deceiver, and promised that he is making a way between heaven and earth for people like him, deceivers, for sinners. The chasm that wrenched heaven and earth apart, that wrenched God and men apart, the chasm that was caused by sin will be bridged. What Jesus is proclaiming is that he is Jacob's ladder. He is the bridge between heaven and earth. He is the way to heaven. Not for perfect saints, but for sinners. Sinners who do not try to deceive anyone about who they are. Repentant sinners. Jesus is the mediator who brings the reconciliation between us and God. Jesus descended from heaven to earth. And then even further into the ground as he was put to death for our sins, even though he was sinless. But then he ascended out of the grave in victory over sin and death and all the way back to heaven to make a way for us to join him there. Jesus is the ladder. He is the way. He is the truth and the light. Jesus opens heaven for God's grace to pour down from heaven above onto his people. And for his people to ascend to God. So do not be deceived by the claims of this world that we've somehow evolved past our need for a way to heaven. We're all seeking a way out of here. A way out of this mire that we've turned God's creation into by our sin. And there's only one way. There was one way for Nathaniel and there's one way for you. When Jacob woke up, from that vision. He said, how awesome is this place? That's what he said. This is none other than the house of God. So he named that place Bethel, where God gave him the vision and this promise of reconciliation. Bethel means the house of God. That's where Jesus promises to, to lead us. To Bethel, to the house of God. If you reject this path to Bethel, if you refuse to follow Jesus, then know that all other paths lead to another place, a place that God named Babel, a place for all who rejected God's plan for reconciliation and instead deceived themselves into thinking that they could build themselves up to be equal with God. They foolishly thought they could build themselves up to heaven. They thought they could forge their own way out of this fallen world, beyond the reach of the flood, beyond the consequences of their sin. They deceived themselves. They thought that they didn't need a way to heaven to be provided to them because they thought they could build their own tower all the way up. So which path are you going to take? The path to Babel or the path to Bethel? There's so many paths to ba Babel, and they all have signposts along the way claiming, you're a good person. You don't need forgiveness. Success awaits status and legacy. My, oh my, a legacy that goes on and on. But all who have ventured down that path know the only thing that Babel delivers is judgment and death and oblivion. Now, if you're looking for the path out of this fallen world, and you know there's no way you can do it on your own. If you're looking to escape the effects of the fall, the toil, the decay, the brokenness, if you're looking for an escape from suffering and sorrow and death, there is only one way. Just follow Jesus. You have to stop deceiving yourself about who you are 
and turn away from who you were. And Jesus will lead you to Bethel, the house of God, for all of eternity. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, please prepare our hearts to receive communion. See us for who we are and do not count our trespasses against us, Lord. If anyone is hearing this message and has not previously been introduced to your son, Jesus, then I pray that they would now see Jesus for who he is. I pray that they would follow him to your promised redemption with a promise of eternal reconciliation with you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray this. Amen. Amen.